Okay, we can go ahead and get started. Um, good afternoon and good evening. Uh, welcome, depending on where you are in the world. Um, thank you so much for coming to this. Uh, this is the Johns Hopkins Center for Public Health and Human Rights, um, here to discuss the decriminalization of sex work. Um, the Oregon Sex Workers Committee is a, product, a project of the Woodhull Freedom Foundation, and we're very honored to be hosted by Johns Hopkins um, to be given the opportunity to platform the voices of some incredible members in our community. Um, my name is Bianca Beebe. I'm a sex worker and MPH candidate here at Johns Hopkins. Um, and I'm also the co-chair of the Oregon Sex Workers Committee and the um, Sex Work Policy Fellow at Free State Justice here in Maryland. Um, and although I go to school um, all over the world, I'm lucky enough to live in New Zealand under a decriminalized system. So my support for decrim comes not only from studying it, but also from being a sex worker lucky enough to live under a decriminalized model. Um, so just so panelists know, this panel will go on for approximately two hours and it's relatively informal. I'll ask questions, but I would love for the panelists to engage with each other, answer questions that are really uh, meaningful to you, step in as you like, um, and we'll try to save some room for uh, Q&A at the end. Um, please also note that this webinar explicitly centers justice for marginalized people. Um, this forum is not a debate on our or anyone else's uh, existence. So things like racism, transphobia, whorephobia will absolutely not be tolerated. Um, and without further ado, I would love to introduce our panelists. Uh, we have, we are lucky to have Tamika Spellman, uh, Casey Voorhees Washington, Esther Kay, and Joaquin uh, Rumora. Um, so instead of me uh, rattling off all of your incredible accomplishments, <laughs> I'd rather let you introduce yourselves and just talk about really briefly, you know, the work that most inspires you and how that relates to sex work decrim. You know, like what does sex work decrim mean in the context of what you're doing? Um, and Tamika, would you like to start us off? I guess so. My name is Tamika Spellman. I am a uh, sex, sex worker advocate working for HIPS. I am their policy and community engagement manager. Um, I come to this work because of all the intersections of identity that I've had in my life and how negatively I've been affected by the system. You know, um, I have a disability, you know, for one. Um, I am Black and transgender. I have 55, I'll be 55 in a few days. You know, so I came up in a time period when it was less understood, you know, it was very violent for my existence, you know, and a lot of that violence that I experienced came from the system. You know, they put me at risk for violence on the streets because of how I was treated by the governing bodies. You know, I come into this work to change the narrative so that the kids coming up behind me don't have to live like I did. You know, um, I've been sex working since I was 14 years old. I still do sex work on occasion when I have time. You know, being an advocate and an organizer, I just don't have the time, especially since COVID. You know, it's just been inconvenient because of so many needs that need to be met. You know, um, I come to this work because I've been a drug user, you know, and I understand how sometimes people need an escape from life, you know, and I also understand the addiction side of it because I've been there. But then I also know that abstinence is, abstinence is the only answer when it comes to drug use and chaotic use. You know, I, I had a problem with the substance at one point in my life, but I still drink and smoke weed today. And I don't have chaos in my life at this time. You know, I come in to let people see what it means that there are nuances to situations. There are circumstances in people's lives that put them in the predicaments that we have to live through. You know, I come to this work and expose my life to make it look human. You know, because I'm, I'm also a parent, you know, and, and I think I did a pretty good job with my kids. <laughs> you know, they, they didn't 
have to do a lot of the things that I've done. You know, they've, they've had a greater existence, but it was a struggle to get there, you know, because a lot of my sisters aren't here. You know, a lot of the people that I came along with, you know, in transition aren't, aren't here anymore. And they succumbed to the violence you know, the violence that the system brought into our lives. That's why I'm here. Thank you so much. Amazing. Um, just going around the screen, uh, we have Joaquin next, if you would. Sure. Um, hi, I'm uh, Joaquin Ramora. I'm the director of housing of Our Trans Home SF in San Francisco, uh, uh, which is a program of St. James Infirmary. Uh, some of you may know it's like the first occupational health clinic by and for sex workers. Um, I think in the country, definitely, maybe the world, I'm not sure, but um, pretty special place. Uh, my story, you know, and why what brings me to the work is um, you know, I think from a very young age, being trans and, and growing up in this world, kind of understanding that, you know, everything that we're taught is a lie <clears throat> and wanting to kind of set off on a journey to uncover the lies in order for, you know, supporting the progress of society and not miss, not allowing to, you know, these societal lies to continue to just keep people separate and live lives of suffering and isolation. Um, and so I was taken under the wing by some trans elders who kind of showed me the way and what things were like before and coming to realize in the moment in which I came to San Francisco to transition in a place where I felt like was going to be supportive enough because there was a larger population of trans people than where I came from. Um, you know, I came to realize that the, these were these moments in histories where all these first times were happening, you know, like this year was the first time. Um, in San Francisco, a city that, you know, trans people come from all over the world, uh, that the mayor recognized uh, Transgender History Month for the first time ever. You know, it's the first time that trans people have access to housing programs that are specific to them because other ones aren't sustainable and they don't work. And here I am, this moment of history to say, you know, directing this program as like the first, it's like, it, it chills me. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's chilling to, to understand that th that that has never happened before. And even for me, um, my age group, like the idea of children transitioning, which is happening all the time more and more now, is like just super emotional, um, you know. But so my story was really just uh, in order to to pursue that life of my of my own, I had to, um, you know, come to a country illegally, uh, not have a work permit, you know, lead to different industries that you survive on, and. Um, and, and then finding out that so many people have the exact same story, you know, uh, of how you had to run away from home and go to here and live on the street and do this and that and the other. And, and we all just had the same old story, you know? Um, and so it's like, I don't know, you, you see the issues and that they need to be changed. And it's really so simple. And so if I have to be out here like a broken record, you know, repeating the things that I'm being told by my mentors, I'm gonna keep doing that. And um, and so I wanna end homelessness for trans people, for sex workers, have healthcare, um, and we're all kind of pushing for that. So kind of that's my investment in, in this particular kind of work. So that's all I'll say for now. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, Esther? Hi everyone. Um, so honored to be in this space with you all. Um, so I'm, a, I'm Esther, I'm a lead organizer with Red King Song, um, and I've been with RCS since 2019 and do work on like anti-trafficking and coalition building with Chinatowns across North America. Um, and it's been around like four to five years I've been involved in anti-trafficking work, uh, and right now I'm also a consultant at the Sex Workers Project of the Urban Justice Center. Um, what am I, how did I get to this work and what am I passionate about? I, so I am a first generation immigrant from Taiwan. Um, my dad's side is indigenous uh, Taiwanese, my mom's side is Han Taiwanese and uh, grew up in pretty uh, low income conditions and uh, did my first sort of like sexualized 
labor. And at the time, I didn't see myself as a sex worker um, or even consider myself part of the industry. I was just um, working at what's known as a meat cafe um, and, you know, work there out of economic necessity because I was rejected from bagging. I was rejected from, you know, washing, <laughs> washing dishes when I was in high school for, for some for some reason. Um, and then uh, when I got to Chicago, I actually joined a pretty harmful anti-trafficking organization and really saw the ins and outs of like how much they work with the police and how much they support the criminal legal system as a solution for both trafficking victims and sex workers. And after being part of that organization, I was just like, I, I can't. I can't be a part of this. Like, you know, we're harming the very people we're trying to to you know, save. And I don't think the savior complex and anti-trafficking organization is also just ridiculous. Um, and after that, I joined Red Canary and have been loved so well by sex workers and learned so much about myself and my own sexuality and my own journey as an Asian an Asian American um, from from them. So. Here I am. Amazing. Thank you so much. And Casey, please. Hi, everyone. My name is Casey Borges Washington. Um, I'm 19. I am based from Central Virginia. Um, sex working to me, um, my big part about sex working is the youth. Um, and the reason why is because something I told myself through all of my teenage years is that if I can just prevent one child from going through what I experienced through my teenage years, I know I left my mark. Um, traveling across the East Coast, um, being kicked out of my own house at the age of 13 is because at that time I identified as a homosexual black man. I knew I was a woman, but I already knew that if it was a lot for me to identify as a homosexual black man, then it would be a lot for me to identify as a trans woman, a black trans woman. Um, me being put out led me to be homeless, led me to be, um, it led to poverty. It, it, it led to survival. It led for me to kick out all my feelings, kick out all my emotions and, and kick into survival mode is because I was the only thing that I had when I was outside. Um, sex work is just, <laughs> it saved me and it damaged me. Um, and my biggest thing is education for the kids of how to conduct yourself, how to focus on your mental health if sex work is the route that you're gonna be on. Um, also the health to it, um, how to be positive, how to, how to stay healthy, how to keep a positive mental space. Um, like I said, my biggest thing is for the youth. Um, I grew up in a time and era where I was outside with all the older girls. Um, that's why I was so intrigued in um, Miss Tanika, because what she said is 100% honest. Most of the girls that I grew up with when I was younger aren't here. They, they aren't here no more. And, 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 and it's either to overdoses because they're self-medicating or it's, it's to the violence that institutions in the state allows or... Um, suicide because they're trapped inside their own mental and things of that nature so the reason why the youth is my biggest priority is because if we can get to the problem before it ever becomes a problem then we can stop a chain of oppression that's all thank you so much and Thank you, all of you, for starting us off on <laughs> such um, uh, with such incredible introductions. Really, um, getting to so much of the personal um, affect and weight of it, um, and that really transitions quite perfectly into something I wanted to start us off with, um, particularly since a lot of the arguments against sex work really relies on the straw man argument of the um, empowerment versus exploitation dichotomy. 
as though it's only one or the other. And the argument is that, uh, you know, that the people who want to abolish uh, sex work say, well, you know, sex work is never empowering, it's only exploitation, um, which is an argument that always really infuriates me because no one is trying to find sexual empowerment through sex work. We're trying to earn money under capitalism. Um, and so I wanted to uh, have just open this up for discussion of why is it that um, decriminalization is what's going to best benefit survival sex workers? It's empowering for me to tell a police officer no. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I've, I've been violated by many of them over the course of my life. And one thing that I know about police is that no matter where it is, where you're at in this country, I've lived in several places, they are all the same. They take advantage of sex workers. They see us out there and they see violent things happen to us and they sit back and they watch. But if you give those little sexual favors to them, they'll let you work. That is exploitive. I do not want anyone over me to say what I can and cannot do. And if I don't do what they want, there's a penalty to pay. You're supposed to be a protector and a server of the people. I am one of those people. If we're going to have police, at least let them police in the right ways. And policing sex workers or trafficking survivors is not the answer. I mean, if something happens to me, the only time I have ever called the police when I was out there in the streets was when I got shot. And that, I've never heard anything else about that shooting. You know, so you didn't, number one, you didn't create safety for me. You never brought me a resolution to what happened to me, but y'all have brought me great amounts of harm. So that is something we need to be talking about is the harm that the system brings in. The police are harmful. They are not there to save any of those victims. They're gonna arrest them. And then if there's something that they can get out of them to arrest somebody else, then that's where they're at. They do not create safety for anyone. They're there after the fact, after things happen and take up the slack then. If there's a crime committed, because if there's no crime committed, they're not interested. This is what people do not understand. They're only deliverable to us is to arrest people. They're not community people that come out and mitigate a problem. That does not happen. So that's where we need to be starting with is this arresting people and thinking that putting them into the criminal justice system is somehow an answer to the problem that starts with a lack of resources. If we want to do something concrete and constructive for survivors and victims, put some resources out there that are tangible, usable, and accessible. Maybe if I could have had, I come from an era where there were good paying jobs before NAFTA came in and those good paying jobs, union protection and wages went away. So I have had good jobs back when I was in between sex work and working because I did both for a long time. I had to fall back on it every time because the good jobs kept going away. And it became a thing of these low wage jobs that did not keep pace with the cost of living. And then I had children you know, what are we left to do but to get out here and make money to make a way for ourselves? I'm an entrepreneur. Do you know how many times I've had to rebrand myself? I'm 55. Do you, I, have, I don't have very much left that I can do for myself. And on, when we're talking about how these systems have set up to keep people involved in this system that is costly, is ineffective. It has not addressed the issue because guess what? It is still going on. Prohibition creates black markets. Stop prohibiting sexual adult consenting behaviors. 
and let's put some resources in there for those that fall into that crack. Something that can actually help them to step out of that scenario, those situations with those circumstances. There are nuances to situations people don't understand and they just keep sweeping it into this one box that's supposed to fit everybody. I, um, Ms. Tamika, I am so sorry um, that that happened to you. I really am. You lived my worst nightmare. Last year, December, um, me and my sister, we decided to go outside on a stroll. And um, we just wanted Christmas. And that was really it. Like, we teenagers from Central Virginia, we didn't really have nothing struggling to pay rent. So we just went out to a stroll. And <laughs> the worst thing ever happened that I've never, ever experienced in my life is because I've always played a safe game. And, you know, um, went up to the car window and four men with ski masks got out and they all held guns to our faces and they stripped us of everything. Now in my head, this is the sad thought that, and I'm embarrassed to say this, but in my head, being able, praising God that I was able to walk away from that situation, I had to go home, take my wig off, unravel my hair, throw on baggy clothes, and then contact the police. Why? Because in my head, I already knew that when I call the police, I already know who they're going to point their fingers at. I already know who they're going to put in fault. Why were you out there? You were on this street. I know what you're doing. I could arrest you right now. Perform this sexual favor for me so you can get out of this. I'm still going to write a police report. You think I've heard anything from that police report? It's going on a year and a half, and I have yet to, no, it's going on a year, and I have yet to hear anything, nothing at all. I was just another case that they wouldn't sweep under the rug. Decriminalizing sex work protects common civil rights for a community that's been oppressed for years. It's common sense. But see, that's the thing. The men that have the power to decriminalize sex work are the men that usually fetish us. They use us. <laughs> they, they, they're, they're the ones. Girl, you said a mouthful. I swear to God. It's just like, you know, it, it, it just makes it that much more real for me because I went through those kind of things at their age. I to do what I want to do with my body. And then when it comes time that I'm in danger and harm and you're supposed to protect me, you're not there to protect me, but you're there to cause more harm and more violence that I've already experienced at that given moment. That's not right and that's not correct. Yeah, listening to both of your stories makes me so sad and angry, sad because this is happening and angry because when anti-trafficking organizations hear these kinds of stories, they co-opted to say sex work, all sex work is dangerous. This is why it's exploitative. And I often see, you know, sex workers overshoot the mark and say it's empowering and it ends up feeding into the straw man argument in this and in, in their attempts to show that not all of this work is um, oppressive, right? And the reality is it's complicated. Like this work is complicated and, um, and it, it's work, you know, there's good days, there's bad days. You know, there's really fucking hard, sorry. <laughs> I don't know if I'm lost. There's really hard days. Um, but at the end of the day, like we, we all deserve rights and we deserve to live and to work safely. Um, I, I just want to thank you both, um, Casey and Tamika, for sharing your experience. Um, <clears throat> and, you know, I'm just thinking back, Bianca, to um, what you were saying about, um, oh, sorry, well, at least my thought. I think what I want to kind of articulate for the public is that under any industry and in capitalism, like the issue is the criminalization of any disenfranchised population, you know what I'm saying? 
be it immigrants, black and indigenous people, trans people. And um, you, you can't like, you have to really take that piece out because it's, 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 we're talking about an industry under capitalism, a way of making money. But, you know, in, 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 in so many different industries is the exploitation of disfranchised people, of marginalized people. Um, and this is one, you know what I'm saying? And this is one in which people are made extremely vulnerable. Um, and again, as you know, you all shared so vulnerably, thank you so much, um, specifically black trans women, um, you know, and so I think that this conversation, and I even see it within the sex worker movement, you know, and, and I read some of the not to jump too far ahead, but I read some of the prompted questions, which I was really excited about, which is, you know, this narrative that like, the sex worker movement is like white cis women. And like me, myself being like a trans man, often in different um, convenings I've been to, one of very few to like be kind of telling this story. Um, I, I just, I, I really observe that piece is that you can have a movement, you can have an industry and you can talk about it however you want. But at the end of the day, it's the larger system um, that has, you know, is holding down the most marginalized people. Um, and that, you know, can be based in gender violence, colorism, uh, class, um, and so really kind of trying to educate people into pulling all these pieces apart within movements and systems um, that we belong to because the issue is that those stories get erased. And so when resources come out of them, they go to the wrong people. Um, and so in my position, <clears throat> really something I've had to work really hard towards in, in you know, holding my position of privilege in this program that I'm directing is making sure that the resources go to the people who need them because we live in a world that's gonna constantly try to erase those people. So we can't even find them to give them the housing, to give them the subsidies, to you know, give them the medical resources. Um, because we live in a world in which society is trying to erase people. And that is the issue, you know what I'm saying? Be it about sex work or, you know, it just happens to be one of the main um, most vulnerable experiences that, that trans people have, that people of color have, um, and that people who, you know, are not benefiting from the capitalist system um, are facing. So I think that that's really what I try to highlight and bring a voice to um, because it's super easy to be in these conversations and be in a sex worker movement and still not really address the issues. Um, so I, I'm just really grateful to be a part of this conversation. Thank you all for um, sharing and for um, including me in this panel, yeah. Thank you all so much. Um, I see there's actually a question in the chat that uh, Ms. Tamika wants to answer. And I think that transitions quite perfectly. Um, thank you guys. Uh, yeah, thank, I'm so humbled by your <laughs> um, incredible honesty and wisdom that you're bringing to this. Um, yeah, it's just incredible. Um, and really prompting from what you just said, Joaquin, about how you know trans men uh, are ignored in this. And I think, um, Talking about um, the dominant narrative of um, that anti-sex work activists construct is really the question of who gets to be a victim, right? They keep talking about how sex work is exploitative and these women are victimized, these victimized women. <laughs> and the implication of that is they're thinking cis women, white women. Um, who make up the majority of sex workers who uh, face comparatively little marginalization within criminalization. It's the people who are already marginalized and vulnerable who are at risk because of criminalization. So we have a question here um, about uh, trafficking specifically and um, underage folks. So um, Ms. Tamika, you said that you wanted to address that and I uh, just wanted to defer to you on that. Yes, decrim for sex work, at least the one in the District of Columbia and the other models that I have seen being tossed around around the country are about adults. The laws that exist for children and trafficking will stay in place. There's not gonna be any change as far as that's concerned. This is about you know, adult behavior. It, it, look at it as as, as, it, as if this was alcohol and alcohol prohibition, okay? We had that issue back in the day with alcohol prohibition being a problem and, and people having toxic supplies of alcohol and, and just any and everybody getting access to it. We put sensible regulation in around it. 
okay, that meant anyone under the age of 18 were restricted access to it. So, I mean, what makes people think that that would not, I'm, I have kids. Even though I started doing sex work at 14 does not mean I want my children to follow suit. You know, as an adult, we have to be conscious of what we're doing and what we're saying. And putting those types of narratives out there are negative and not true. We are talking about adult consenting behavior, not children and trafficking. And that's a whole different realm. You know, if the only way I could say I have ever been a victim of trafficking is because of the capitalist system. Do I need to put that together for you so you have a clear understanding of that? I am forced in this world to get out here and make a way for myself without any help from the said system that put capitalism into play. They have put every kind of roadblock in my way to keep me from succeeding. I came up in a time when there were no services for young people. I worked my ass off to make sure that they have them today. And there are still gaps and pitfalls with that. They're not perfect, but we're still here. We're still working on it. What we need to be working on is freeing adults to be adults and making sure that we're being more protective of the children. If the police are less involved in what my grown ass is doing, maybe they can get out here and keep an eye on what's going on with these kids if we want to have police. Because in my opinion, I don't need them. They do not create safety. We as a community create safety. I'm one of them nosy neighbors. Don't let nothing happen outside my door. I'm, I'm like my mama was. I come out there with my belt. And these kids respect me. As an elder, I am respected. And even though they know I'm a sex worker, how about that? They knew I was a drug user, how about that? We have to get out of that mindset that I don't know what I'm doing, that they, these other panelists do not know what they're doing. We are talking about adult behavior. Thank you so much for that. I wanted to also ask Casey um, for some of your um, thoughts on this, since you are actually still a teenager. Um, the only one of us who still is. Um, and one thing I wanted to point out as well, um, as far as decriminalization um, and uh, youths, um, I think a lot of people don't know how many trafficked minors are arrested for prostitution. Um, it's a massive problem. And no system of decriminalization um, supports uh, people under the age of 18 engaging in sex work. The problem is that because sex work is criminalized, those youths who need help, the only way they can access supposed resources is by being arrested, which they then don't get. <laughs> so um, yeah, I just wanted to point that out for um, people in the chat there. And Casey, please give us your, give us your experience and knowledge. First of all, Miss Tamika, I love you and I don't even know you. <laughs> like I, I really do because you remind me of my grandmother. Um, she's no longer here with us, but she that's the same thought she had. Now with me saying this, I say this. Nobody's gonna ask me a question about sex working and being a youth because until you have something that can fill that gap of me surviving, don't question me about what I have to do to survive. Now, does it make it right? No. Does that stem to a bigger problem? Yes, it does. But if you don't have somewhere, if you don't have safe housing for me to have gender confirmation, if you don't have food for me to eat, if you don't have money for me to go to clothes, if you don't have a stable place for me to be able to get my education, if you don't have a place that I can grow and be successful without having to exploit myself, then don't question me. Don't, don't, don't talk about what I'm doing. Don't question, you, you are only causing more problem than helping the problem. Now, I seen somebody say 18 to 24. Now, 18 to 24, 18, you're a consensual adult. 
And that stems back around to, instead of asking the question of what can I do to, well, how do you feel about this? Or what's this change? You're still a child, like-minded, you know, 1824 is still youth, okay. Are you out there fighting the fight to get programs for 18 to 24 year olds so they don't have to resort to sex work? It's because I'm not saying that trans women are the only women that have to resort to sex work, but once again, we're an oppressed community. We don't have the same I think you, you might have frozen, Casey. Oh. They're trying to stop us because they don't think that we're valid and they don't see us as humans. So that, that's my answer to that. <laughs> Amazing. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, also... I would love to, um, I'm kind of looking at some of the questions in the chat and I would love to give some context to some of the people in the chat who like may not be familiar with how anti-trafficking laws work um, on the ground, right? So just a little context, really quick context. In the last 20 years, the anti-trafficking discourse and policies have shifted to specifically target sex workers, even though every single in industry can be exploited for migrants, for children, you know, um, youth labor happens in uh, the farming industry, it happens in the restaurant industry, but it does not get targeted by the trafficking, um, by tra trafficking nonprofits in the same way. That doesn't excuse it, but I think it's just to highlight the fact that um, sex workers and survivors of trafficking get a disproportionate amount of attention when it comes to this issue. Um, and due to the shift in the last 20 years, this has led to this assumption that all migrant sex workers are trafficking victims and anti-trafficking nonprofits make a lot of money off of swooping in to assist and rescue off of this conflation between sex workers and trafficking victims. Um, and yeah, in, in New York, what we see often is the Human Trafficking Intervention Court incentivizes um, even if you're a consensual sex worker, they incentivize you to self-identify as a trafficking uh, survivor or victim in order to access nonprofit legal services, right? And the alternative, if you uh, self-identify as a um, sex worker of any kind, is you get a crim you know, criminal legal penalty and then you, um, you lose uh, you know, you lose time, you lose money. In, in the case of massage businesses, oftentimes, their savings get uh, confiscated by the police. So um, I think it's really important to just contextualize how uh, the criminal legal system actually operates and it does not operate to protect the people who um, need the most protection. And you know, what helps, what we need is community protection, community support and to actually defund, buy, defund um, the anti these harmful anti trafficking nonprofits. Yeah. Do people even know that these anti trafficking organizations are pushing these diversion courts? How do you divert someone from being trafficked? Give them the resources they need so they don't have to get into that scenario again. How about that instead of pushing them through a court system that penalizes and fines them? What purpose does that serve? To divert means to move someone from one place to another. They're not moving people. They're putting them back out there and making them vulnerable. A lot of people that are in trafficking scenarios end up back in trafficking scenarios because the problem, the root issue was not addressed. If they're not coming in with tangible, usable, accessible resources, money, apartments, education, and a living wage job, leave them damn people alone. How about that? Since we're getting a fair bit of um, 
uh, comments in the chat, uh, particularly about the Nordic model. I wanted to set that up because it talk, um, that's a really good way of talking about exit services and resources. So just so we're all on the same page, uh, the Nordic model is also called the end demand model. And under this model, um, selling sex is not criminalized, but purchasing or attempting to purchase sex is criminalized as is quote unquote facilitating prostitution, which is supposed to mean pimping, but it means basically anything tangentially related to sex work. Um, so there is a really famous example of in Norway, um, Operation Homeless uh, literally went around and um, got the landlords who were letting flats to sex workers to kick them out, uh, making them homeless because uh, they were doing sex work. So. One of the arguments um, that people like to say with the Nordic model is that we should give people resources to exit sex work. And I've yet to hear a single sex worker on this earth say that, no, we don't need resources. Who wants that? <laughs> so let's talk about why the Nordic model, all of you uh, believe, is not going to actually facilitate getting sex workers who are vulnerable the resources they need. Because this is very important, because although sex work is still criminalized in the United States, the police departments informally have implemented the Nordic model all over in different states and major metropolitan cities. So although the Nordic model is not the law, it's here and it's still victimizing it us. So we need to talk about it. I feel like they're implementing that here in the District of Columbia because of the data coming from some arrest records, but that's something I'm planning on investigating soon myself. The Nordic model is not good for sex workers. I mean, have people ex sex workers? No, but I have. I've talked to people all across the world that live under the Nordic model and how harmful it has been to them. You know, it's making their lives harder. It's harder to connect with dates. It's making, I have to meet the date where they want to meet it now. This is what they're saying. They're saying that they're being faced with lower wages because the date has the, the power in the negotiation now. They're losing the battle against wearing condoms because the date has the power. If they want to make the money, which is being, being made very hard for them now, you turned over all the power to the date instead of the power being in these sex workers' hands. You know, then there's this issue with how do you criminalize what ultimately is a transaction? You criminalize on one side of it. How It's like saying, okay, here's some alcohol, but you can't buy it. It's like saying, okay, we have marijuana legislation. You can buy the marijuana, but you can't smoke it. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? Why are we even looking at keeping part of this whole scenario criminalized when the whole part of this that we want to stop is the criminalization? We're trying to move to health and well-being situation, helping people to get Stabilize. I mean, I have had a life of up and damn down for decades because of the, the way I've been criminalized. You know, I, I wish I could have been paying taxes on this. I can get a return. You know, stop making my life hard. Where this is supposed to be the land of milk and honey, the American dream. Entrepreneurs are supposed to reign supreme. You're raining on my parade, and then we have like this tiered system here in the United States where we have the legalized porn industry, but don't let me make no porn. Come on. It's just a waste of time. It's a waste of energy to even self-implement something that we didn't ask for. You're making it harder on us. So, um. I want to speak on this, and I know that we were just told not to speak on that, but I also want to speak on it, and Bianca, as my coworker, you do understand that this is why I'm going to speak on it. I'm the community organizer for Free State Justice, and my biggest policy right now that I'm working on is HIV decriminalization. 
and see the comment that Clyde made is the problem right there. You want to ask questions about STIs and transmission and this, but the way that you formed your comment is what causes the stigma for sex workers to contract diseases, which causes people not to want to get tested and which causes people to be scared to know their status and which causes them to not want to live in their truth or tell and tell their status. That's all the stigma. I think I went out. Did, can y'all hear me? Your video is frozen, but your audio is still going. Okay. Okay. Um, which spreads the stigma. Everybody has the answers to the questions that they're asking. Well, that specific question, you have the answer. You know the answer to it. So don't make it seem like, oh, sex work is the main cause of the STIs and um, disease transmission. No, the stigma. Ooh, we just lost your audio. We lost the audio on the last part of what you were saying, baby. <laughs> Can you, oh can you hear me? Okay, yeah. Okay, so what I was saying is, um, hold on, I gotta get my brain. My bad, sorry. I just, I get so flustered is because I've been HIV positive since I was 16 years old. And, and it wasn't me doing sex work. It was the stigma behind sex work. It was the stigma behind HIV. It wasn't sex work, let alone, it's always the stigma. Everybody has the answers to the questions when it comes to those type of questions. They know exactly what they mean. It's them being sarcastic. I know I wasn't supposed to answer that, Bianca. I know I wasn't supposed to react to Clyde, but I really wanted to do that is because I wanted to inform um, the viewers that it's not sex workers that are transmitting STIs. It's not sex workers that are transmitting HIV. And that's not the leading cause. The leading cause is the stigma and the idea everybody has behind these STIs and STDs. If we can get some type of program in order, if we can get some type of resource in order where sexual education is a main priority, proper education on um, sex, things of that nature, getting tested, making testing be normalized, then we, we, would, we wouldn't face this. Thank you so much for that, Casey. I, uh, just to be clear, I did not ask you to not say anything. I'm sorry. Um, I, I was encouraging us to, to not feed the trolls. Um, and I, I kicked that dude out because he wasn't being useful. Um, and just to clarify for people as well, if you're still curious about how any of this would actually work under decrim, as somebody who lives and works under decrim, um, pretty much all sex workers I know get tested regularly, but it's not required here so that um, it doesn't perpetuate stigma. If you only allow sex workers to perform labor if they pass or pass an STI test, you end up excluding a very marginalized population. Um, and you also make it so that your employer has access to your STI results, which is a terrible idea. Um, and just, I mean, practically speaking, here in New Zealand, like sex workers get, all of my friends and myself, you know, you can get tested for free, um, you can access resources to the degree that, you know, the public health nurses almost get annoyed with how often we come in, because they're like, you all are the only ones using condoms. Sex workers are the least likely people in New Zealand to have uh, an STI, because you guys are so responsible and safe. If I want to go find some STIs, I'm going to go to the bar. Right, I'm gonna go to the straight bar where they don't, in, you know, uh, take care of themselves as much. Um, so it's really uh, important to recognize that we're not like harbingers of disease or something like that. That is a myth perpetuated by stigma. Um, and I turn it over to you, Esther. Yeah, I actually wanted to uh, and then answer the. We have... Oh, all good. Uh, I actually want to answer the original Nordic model question, um, but I would love to return to the like public health question because I think that's actually really important um, and it has a lot of relevancy to massage workers and massage businesses because after COVID happened, right, like the rise in anti-aging violence is exactly like the kind of violent response people have towards 
massage workers, against like Asian um, sex workers, when really the, the fear of the disease is just the uh, symptom of a deeper kind of stigma. So I, 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 would, I can talk for like hours on that, but I wouldn't just put a pin in that. Um, so uh, someone was asking how does the Nordic model, which has been rebranded in New York to be called the equality model now, so just flagging that, um, how does that become a virus market? Uh, so to put it like very simply, if you criminalize everything around a sex worker, you're in effect criminalizing the sex worker, right? Um, and it continues to require the sex worker to avoid the police. And it becomes a virus market because it can require the sex worker to take more risks to protect their clients. And they may be exposed to more violent clients due to the need to protect them. Something that a lot of sex workers do right now if they're meeting clients in person um, is they do screening where they see IVs, you know, they make sure that they're safe before meeting a client, whether it's in-call or out-call. If the Nordic model, uh, you know, is enacted, which it is in, in under full decrim, I mean, under full criminalization, um, people are less likely to be screened, to show their ID, to, you know, send their social media to, um, for the sex worker to screen them because they're, they're afraid of being arrested and they're afraid of um, the person on the other side of the screen um, being, being biased or the police. Um, it increases isolation and makes it difficult for sex workers to have community and social networks. Um, and, you know, this continued criminalization affects, again, like black and brown folks the most. Um, and yeah, I, I think, uh, yeah, again, like a really good example of how the Nordic model is harmful is through um, trafficking laws um, around uh, landlords and rents. So if you are working in your place of, um, if you're renting and you're living in your you know, place or you're, and you're taking clients uh, as an in-call, um, the landlord often will evict you because you're afraid of uh, being uh, considered a pimp under trafficking law, right? This will continue to happen under the Nordic model. Um, whereas under full decrim, there's going to be less fear of that kind of eviction and homelessness. Thank you so much. Um, uh, there, there's, so, there's so much insight going on here in the chat and here you guys are amazing. <laughs> um, I wanted to transition to talking about legalization as well. And I think this is a thing that a lot of people get confused. Um, legalization and decriminalization are really different. So under a decriminalized model, um, consensual adult sex work is just removed from the criminal code. So here in New Zealand, you know, I can work alone with a partner in a brothel through an agency, you know, what, how, how I want to work. Um, whereas in a legalized model, which is what we see in um, the Netherlands, Germany, and some of the brothels in Nevada, you have to be registered as a sex worker, you have to submit to mandatory STI testing, um, and you have to work in a licensed venue. So I want to talk about, uh, particularly, Ms. Tomiko, you brought up um, how much um, uh, sex work is interrelated with um, drug criminalization and sex work criminalization, criminalization. And I think we can really learn some lessons from how we legalization has gone in the United States in which we have you know, very wealthy white men who are controlling dispensaries while black and brown young men are in jail for doing the exact same things. <laughs> so I wanted to start off with Esther, if that's okay, um, talking about massage licensing in New York. And to be clear, this is not licensing for sensual massage. This is licensing for any kind of massage. Um, yeah, so um, licensing is a huge issue. So the majority of uh, massage workers get arrested not for prostitution, uh, under prostitution laws actually, but for licensing um, and for practicing without a license. And the reason why a lot of massage workers do not have a license is because the fees are incredibly high. Um, a lot of them are migrants, right? They're often working long hours, uh, providing for family, for their children, 
and they um, you know either can't afford the, the licensing fee which is in I think like and it, it renews each year too um, it's like in the I think it's in three figures in the three figures in New York um, and the legalization of sex work like the one we see in uh, Nevada continues to bar the most marginalized groups of people from accessing this type of work. Um, in RCS, when we provide aid for massage workers, we do not ask if they are a trafficking victim. We don't ask if they're a sex worker. Um, we don't, you know, we don't ask those questions because frankly, we find them to be unhelpful distinctions when we're providing aid. Um, there's also the issue of, uh, not an issue, but um, there's a cultural barrier too with a lot of massage workers where they often don't self-identify as sex workers, um, even if they are providing sexual services, they often see themselves as massage uh, workers who like maybe does something extra on the side, uh, like a hand job um, to make ends meet if rent gets raised, for example. And oftentimes when massage workers are thinking about uh, being a sex worker and thinking of full service sex work, they don't actually see it as a spectrum um, from say like cam girls to, to full service and um, matrixes. Um, so legalization will continue to impose a regulatory framework with, uh, with laws regarding like where, when, and how sex work can take place. Um, and this uh, system continues to have similar issues as the one we currently have and creates a two-tiered system of legal and illegal sex workers. Um, and it will continue to have barriers uh, to safety and resources for those outside of the legal framework. Um, and on top of that, it will we'll continue to allocate resources to law enforcement and other government agencies to regulate consensual private behavior. Um, all of that is, again, going to be most harmful to people who are most marginalized. Um, this also kind of does touch on uh, the uh, public health issue too, um, where um, you know it uh, it requires sex workers to keep up with like registration fees, costs, licenses, um, health insurance that they now have to pay for themselves, which can be difficult for people with little money and resources. Um, yeah, and um, in in cases of Nevada and Germany, legalization regulates this type of work in a specialized way that makes it different from other kinds of work. So, it's, um, so I personally think that, you know, sex trafficking and labor trafficking should actually be under one umbrella. They shouldn't be regulated differently and shouldn't be um, tackled differently. Thank you so much. Oh, Joaquin, were you about to say something on that? No? Okay, amazing. Um, so I wanted to transition to talking about housing. Um, I think a lot of people who aren't um, in sex work activism don't really realize how um, much sex work criminalization is an incredibly strong driver of the vast number of unhoused people that we have in the USA. Um, and I wanted to start with you, Joaquin, and talking about all of your work and how um, sex work decriminalization um, is part of that kind of advocacy. For sure. Um, yeah, um, you know, it's been interesting that um, the program is specifically a, tra a trans-specific program, but it was assigned to, uh, you know, sex work occupational health clinic. And predominantly because of the ways that, um, you know, as others shared, uh, and my own experience, um, a lot of times trans people, we are so limited on resources and pushed to these means of having no other option and how we survive um, to be seen as human, really, um, that we we result we uh, resort to uh, things like sex work, and especially because of the ways in which fetishization functions. And, um, you know, for myself, really, I had the experience of going from working as a cis woman to working as an FTM trans man. And when that happened, my, um, my income was cut in half essentially uh, because of the treatment of trans people and um, really felt that it was less so, you know, there's a way in which, you know, as a cis woman, I might have um, felt like an experience. And, um, and as a trans man, I might have felt more like an experiment, you know? Uh, <laughs> It, it, I don't know if that makes sense too, but but it really kind of shows the the ways in which like trans people are really dehumanized by society, especially 
um, although sex workers are across at large as well. Um, trans people, I believe, are marginally uh, in a completely different way. So, um, you know, I'm just kind of trying to tie these things together as to, um, uh, so, so, and again, it, it comes back to like this story, right? Like so many trans people have this story of you had to run away from home, you had no other means but to get into kind of legal industries, predominantly often sex work, you were in the streets, there were no, you know, resources that, um, you know, could hold you. Um, and I'm going to talk about trans people because that's just, I don't really know. I can't really talk about cis sex workers anymore. <laughs> I don't remember how to. Uh, but uh, so, um, you know, the, one of the issues here and why we're pushing so hard for like what predominantly what we're advocating for trans housing is um, that um, the current public shelter systems or housing programs are not safe for sex workers and especially for trans people. So oftentimes, um, you know, I, I've worked in navigation centers where pimping is happening. Uh, I worked in one where, you know, there was a group of sex workers. Um, one of them was uh, a young trans woman who had gotten a settlement for being attacked and then she was pimped out and they took that from her in the shelter. <laughs> and so it's like the girls are, and you know, there's not a lot of trans men. So I was like, I really mostly work with trans women um, supporting and doing what I can because I, I see I see these ladies kind of like have to go back to the street, you know, because it's not even safe to be in the shelter. And it's like you're more in danger <laughs> in the space that it's supposed to be protecting you. And that is unacceptable. You know what I'm saying? So having to push these um, housing resources that are um, actually culturally competent to hold and create safety and to understand not only the physical safety, but the psychological and emotional safety of, of trans people and of sex workers. Um, and so much of that has to do, do with just dignity um, at large and the fact that most people and most public resources don't even understand what dignity looks like for sex workers and for trans people. Um, so that's kind of what my avenue is to really kind of educate and tell the story of the emotional psychological impact of trans people, of sex workers. You know, uh, one of, like the COO of St. James, who I work very closely with, you know, has talks about kind of healthcare for sex workers by saying, be nice to sex workers. Like really, you know, if you're gonna go to the doctor, like it's really, that's all, <laughs> that goes such a long way is to just have the person like be nice to you, be aware that you have feelings, that you can be made to feel bad, that you are predominantly made to feel bad in the world at large, and to just go above and beyond to, to have that humanity, you know what I'm saying? And, and that's something that is so taken for granted. Um, and so I try to put a lot of focus on that because I, like I say, like you create the most perfectly ran program and it wouldn't serve the people if they didn't trust you, if they didn't like you, they don't wanna work with you. So, you know, I feel like in organizing and creating these new models and new resources, um, that's a way in which like, you know, the, the, the avenues in which we have to create them are all under a white supremacist capitalist structure, the nonprofit world, right? White on top. Um, and so, you know, uh, you know, we try to kind of create financial equity and, you know, try to recreate and push back against these structures in which we're supposed to put our people in, in which they never fit into in the first place, you know? So um, I, I always need to like name that as far as like any kind of like resource housing, medical care, food, um, you know, it, it's like remembering that the, that the shape of the structure is not made to hold the people. Um, and that's why those people aren't getting those resources, you know what I'm saying? And I'm um, kind of like Casey said earlier, it's like, if you don't give me the means to survive, then you don't get to say what I do to survive. Um, and so for me, it's like really kind of trying to educate the general public on reshaping their minds around so many people, especially white people, you know, walk through the world thinking this is the only way, you know what I'm saying? It's like, you, you know, like you have a job, you work for an organization. It's like, you could just they, like learning how to be in a nonprofit for me, I realized so many um, hurdles are created out of habit and you could just take those barriers away and save somebody's life in a day, you know, to say, okay, you didn't have to go to five appointments to fill out a million paperwork because they were redundant and then you didn't make it to one appointment. So then you didn't get your housing. You know what I'm saying? It's like, if you could have the person actually go take the person to all of these things or make them all happen in one place, you can literally save someone's life, you know? And 
And I feel like just really pushing people to understand the ways in which we can create access, access and, and cultural competence to understand. But in order to have that, you have to give those jobs to the people who understand what it is to live that experience. You know what I'm saying? So I, I'm kind of, um, I'm going off housing because like something I say about our clinic, for example, is like, you know, you could have therapy, you, you know, you could have all these other things, but at the end of the day, when you go back out to the street and you don't have somewhere to sleep at night, it's like, what good does it serve you? You know what I'm saying? Housing is the utmost important place to start. You can't build up your life. You can't, you can't uplift yourself if you don't have a place to sleep at night. If you don't have, if you don't know where you're going to put your body next, you know, when I was unhoused, that was the one thing I remember more than anything is saying, how can I think about anything else of where I'm going to be in two weeks from now? If I don't even know where I'm going to put my body tomorrow, because that takes up so much energy and space in my mind, you know, having to question that. And so um, housing is the, the primary uh, resource specifically for any marginalized person, but predominantly there is a link between BIPOC, colonized people, black and indigenous people, um, classism uh, in the history of this nation, and then the ways in which gender violence pushes people into sex work. Um, so, I mean, I hope that's the best way I can tie it all together and just kind of highlight some of the the hitters of like what what we're trying to do here and why it really needs to be seen and challenged the, the, the way that the world has shaped our minds to think that that better things aren't possible when they absolutely are and we could make those things happen so easily it's just a matter of doing them you know so that's what i'll say for now <laughs> um housing is like one of the biggest things i feel like housing is your temple and um I feel like you can't be your best you without stable housing. Me at 19, and since I was 13, I finally can say that I actually have a place that is mine. <laughs> like, this is my first ever place that's mine, and it, it just changed me in a whole. It was like, I have a place where I can come home and decompress. I have a place I can come home and I could shut myself off from the world and hide when I feel like the world has begun to be so much. It's a place where I can break down. It's a place where I can smile. It's a place where I can pray. It's a place where I can, it's just a place where I can be me, my authentic self. I don't have to put on a smile. I don't have to put on a frown. I can be me. Housing, especially to youth, especially to homeless youth that have to go to sex work. Like they're literally tiring their self out and they don't have that place where they can decompress since i was 13 i was couch hopping i was <laughs> i was just talking to my aunt she's a woman of trans experience and i was just talking about her and we were just talking about how back in the day and, and i don't know miss tanika if you can speak on this but back in the day how the girls used to go over their girlfriend's house that they used to fake fall asleep so they would have a place to lay their head at or, you know, things of that nature, or the girls will put up money so they could have a hotel room or things of that nature, or it would be like 10 trans girls in a one bedroom apartment or things of that nature. And it, it's just- Maybe that's still going on today. Yeah, it, it, it definitely is still going on it's today. It's still going on today. You know, well, it, it, will, that's the I, sad thing about it <laughs> is that the things that went on in my time are still going on today, 40 years uh -oh. later. I am a youth ambassador for Baltimore's number one trans leading nonprofit organization, trans led nonprofit organization, Baltimore Safe Haven. Um, founder Aya Damons. Um, I have to say this on here because Aya Damons was a sex worker. She understood the struggles and she turned herself around and she's providing direct housing, direct health care, H We can't hear you, baby. Services to lesbians. Um, um, I, I think that I just lost connection. Um, am I back? Okay. See, um, I was saying that she doesn't just serve the trans, the trans individuals. She serves to everybody, especially the community. Um, food, lunches, breakfasts, um, harm reduction, um, 
proper sex utensils, things of that nature. So I definitely want to give a um, shout out to Baltimore Safe Haven because they're actually in Baltimore doing the work and they're doing the work with no funding. And, 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 and that's the thing. And housing can, I, I've seen firsthand how housing can change a person. Once you get a person stable housing, that's their start to, you see that light at the end of the tunnel. You see, you start to see a person begin to glow. You start to see a person being able to, okay, I now have housing. Let me go out here and if they didn't finish school, let me go back to school. Let me go out here and let me get a better job. Let me go out here and let me be a better me. Oh, today I'm gonna do this. Housing is a main key, a main priority and everybody should have a bed where they can lay their head at and feel good about themselves and be able to decompress. Yeah, I kind of want to talk about um, housing as it relates to gentrification of Chinatowns. Um, so every single Chinatown in North America that I have been in contact with is being gentrified. Rent is going up in an attempt to evict people um, and trafficking ways are happening, especially in what's considered red light districts in order to push um, low-income migrant people out of their uh, living spaces um, in order for these big development companies to build their luxury high-rises or the next like hip coffee shop um, and unfortunately you know some of these big development companies are international Chinese companies um, and you know it's uh, it's a it's a whole system at play um, when it comes to that so a lot of massage workers um, live in their place of work because it is cheaper and because they don't have to, oftentimes it's just a convenience thing. They don't have to travel back and forth between their place of living. They can save money on bus fares um, and they can get, you know, clients in, in, in uh, out uh, like in sort of like later hours. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a lot more convenient for all of them. Um, unfortunately, under current trafficking laws, if you live in your place of work, um, if you, there's food in the fridge, for example, when police raid uh, massage businesses, all of those things are seen as signs of trafficking because technically under the law, you're held at your place of work. Um, and when the police see that, often they, they just, you know, they oftentimes just arrest everyone on site. Um, we've also heard stories of the police repeatedly asking questions in English saying, are you trafficked over and over again until the a massage worker who, you know, is, if, if they're not English competent, they eventually say yes, you know, just to say whatever. They don't know what they're agreeing to. And that becomes evidence um, in their case for, for trafficking. Um, yeah, housing in, in Chinatowns is, you know, it, there needs to be anti-gentrification efforts. There needs to be and to uh, anti 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 harmful trafficking efforts, um, and you know, and honestly, like better wages for people so that they can afford to travel back and forth if they want to. So if they don't want to stay in their place of work. They don't have to. What about the conversation about traffic labor? I mean, sex work trafficking is a labor issue. You know, what about labor issue? where people are being trafficked into other industries like farming, hotel, motel, restaurants, even hospitals. We don't talk about that because those are legal industries. But those people are trafficked and children are trafficked there too. But it's always that conflation of trafficking around sex work that gets targeted when those trafficking numbers in sex work are way smaller than those in the other areas. You know, it, it, that's something that's not brought to the table all the time. And then sex work is work. So it's a labor issue. I really want to um, explore that labeling as well. Um, we often have this um, big distinction between sex work and sex trafficking. And with the Oregon Sex Workers Committee, we've been trying to get the Portland Police Department to stop doing prostitution stings. 
Um, and a lot of this is done under the anti-trafficking unit, even though it almost never results in a trafficking charge or conviction. But of course, in the media, we hear that, you know, there was a trafficking raid and they made all these arrests. So people assume, ah, traffickers have been arrested and now the community is marginally safer. Um, so I wanted to have any of you um, sort of talk us through what actually happens to people who are, uh, to sex workers um, who are either arrested or detained or whatever happens to them during an anti-trafficking raid in which they are ostensibly the victims being trafficked. I mean, that depends on if they actually have a, a victim of trafficking, which in a lot of those instances, they never do. You know, it's, <laughs> that's the thing that gets me is that they go out and they cast these gigantic nets and round up hundreds of people off of the streets and don't have any victims. You know, and, and, and there you've got all these people that you have in custody and you're running them down and badgering them with a barrage of questions that are not relevant to them. You know, and that if I'm in an arrest situation, I don't want to talk to you. I want to get out of there. I want to get back to my life, especially if I am a consenting sex worker. You're interrupting my night. You're stopping me from making money. I very well may lose the room that I've rented for the night. You know, my property that's in that room, medications, clothing, these wigs are not cheap. You know what I'm saying? My clothing is not cheap. Those shoes that I buy are not cheap and it is hard to replace those things. A lot of times IDs and things are in those rooms that we are occupying. And if I'm in jail and can't get out because they're holding me as a victim of trafficking that does not exist and don't get anything out of me and they release all these people what purpose did it serve but to spend people's tax dollars? It did not serve a purpose. Okay, on the instance that it is a victim. Arresting them is not gonna solve their problem because if you're not gonna give them somewhere to stay, they're gonna end up going back to their trafficker. Especially if they're not willing to talk to you about it because a lot of times those people that are their traffickers are friends of the family, family members, you know, people that they, they love and care about. They're in nuanced situations that are not easy to walk away from. They may have children with this person. You know, did they even consider that maybe arresting these folks is not the right answer? How about go out and have a conversation with them and see if there's some resource that I might be able to offer you to help you to get out of that situation? This is not the way that we are supposed to be handling these types of instances of trafficking. Arresting folks is not the answer. Yeah, could you uh, repeat the question again, Bianca? Oh, I uh, was just talking about, uh, I don't remember specifically what I asked, <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, basically how, um, the police like to uh, frame all anti-prostitution raids as anti-trafficking raids, right? So even, so um, an enormous amount of money is poured into anti-sex trafficking um, efforts. Um, labor trafficking is disproportionately ignored. So we have all of these resources going into sex trafficking. No one is more anti-sex trafficking than sex workers. But I think that in media, we will see, um, you know, propaganda, right? People are, see that um, the cops did an anti-trafficking raid. They made all these arrests and they're like, ah, the community must be safer. Um, but can you talk a bit about, you know, the trafficking to deportation pipeline and like what actually happens to the supposed victims of trafficking during these raids? Yeah, so there's so many examples of how raids are ineffective and how they actually don't find trafficking victims. So a good example of this is Operation Cross Country. It's documented. They did a whole did a sweep across the US for trafficking rings, found no victims. They only arrested consensual sex workers doing that, that raid. Um, 
So, our, you know, Red Canary, we started because Yang Song, who was a massage worker, she died during one of the trafficking raids in, in, in Flushing, and she either fell or jumped to her death from um, her, her building in order to avoid the police. And it is a known fact across sex workers, across trafficking survivors, across massage workers that the police are not there to help you and they are going to make your lives worse. There's, the police just does not, the trafficking rates, they destabilize people's lives regardless of what kind of work they're doing and it, it, it's ineffective. Um, the reason why like massage businesses um, are such big targets for trafficking raids is not because they actually care about you know, survivors or victims. Um, it's because it's a way for the government to police immigrant communities, especially low income immigrant communities. It's a way for them to arrest them. And again, the majority of the time when massage workers are arrested, they're not, you know, they're not arrested for prostitution charges. They actually get, again, arrested for like licensing issues or documentation issues or, you know, sleeping at their place of work um, or, you know, a myriad of other like tiny laws that uh, migrants are not, um, you know, they're just, it's stacked against the system, it's stacked against them to, to work their way up. Um, and, and they get deported, you know, like when the, um, was that a uh, person that um, football, uh, that football guy? What's his yeah, name? what is his name? He was arrested in Florida the, yeah. um, during the Super Bowl. There was a trafficking raid on a massage parlor in Florida because there's always that weird myth that trafficking spikes during the Super Bowl. Um, yes. mm -hmm. yeah. yeah forgot his name, but uh, during that raid, they arrested all of the massage workers that you know, were in that business, continue to push them during questioning if they're you know, trafficking victims. And all of them said no. Oh, Kraft, yeah, Robert Kraft, yeah. All of them said no. Um, Robert Kraft is now still you know, rich and had no issues from that trafficking raid. Um, and now all, these, all of these consensual massage workers um, have, you know, a good majority of them have lost their savings. Um, they've been completely displaced uh, from their place of work. And, um, you know, some of them were held in jail for months at a time. And like a few are either deported or, or currently in deportation proceedings. Um, all for what? You know, all for what? Like the government spent all this money on this raid, helped no one, like for what? Like this is an ineffective way to support these communities. Um, and it's intentionally created to be that way because again, it's to police immigrants and low income migrant communities. Uh, Joaquin, did you wanna add anything to that? I know you were um, coming in and out with uh, internet fluctuating, sorry, just wanted to Step you in if you had anything to add. Um, totally. Um, you know, I, I, I'm not sure if I'm bearing too off the question, too far off the question, but what it makes me think of is, you know, I was on a, a community radio um, interview kind of talking about the work that we do at St. James and the work of our program. And, you know, I just try to always remember that there are people that, you know, might just really need that kind of 101. So just to share my experience, it was, uh, you know, not having a work permit and, you know, finding the means in which, you know, I, you know, initially I started like subbing in BDSM and that was, you know, when back when Backpage was up and, you know, you, you could just like set, you know, tell people like my friends picking me up this time. And, you know, it's like, these are my rates. This is what I do, what I don't do. Like here's, I could make up my own screening for you. Cause I didn't do my own, whatever, but um, you know, and then that went away and it was just like horrible, you know, and it's like, people really think that they're protecting people by like trying to, you know, Sesta Fosta really hit so hard with um, the trafficking campaigns of people really thinking like, 
that they were doing something to protect sex workers and uh, sorry to be redundant or anything, but um, I just really, I really have to kind of drive that home to people who might not have the full picture because it's such a well-intentioned argument, right? Like they're just, people are just like, oh no, like it's logical that we would want to stop this from happening, not realizing the impact, you know? And for me personally, that pushed me basically to like the street um, and no, no screening, no, you know, like, de like death to desperation in which like all of that agency I had over my life and what happened to me was just gone, you know? And, um, and then it was like just taking much more desperate means. So I think that I just like to share that as like my personal experience with the, what trafficking movements have done to, you know, the industry that has created so much danger for, for marginalized sex workers, for undocumented sex workers, um, you know, and then, uh, and then tied to that, all the kind of surveillance I had, uh, one of my oldest best friends was uh, kind of like, um, you know, had a situation and then was banned from the country for five years. So it was just all in this time in which like, you know, the Trump administration really hit so hard with the SESTA-FOSTA stuff. And um, I don't know, you know, it was just, I, I, I don't know, I just, we, we lived it, you know what I'm saying? We lived it and I, I don't know that people are fully even aware of what that can do to someone's life, you know? So I'd always try to just share that story because uh, <laughs> it's like devastating, you know? It's like devastating uh, to think about all of the undocumented people, all the people that might be, you know, might've been deported to, um, you know, someone's life just completely thrown off by these, like you said, tiny little laws and things like this that that the greater world can't even lay eyes on half the time because they don't know our story. They don't they don't see us, you know, as a part of the greater story. So um, anyway, that's all I have to share right now. <laughs> yeah. I want to add one last thing. I kind of said like, and for what, as like a rhetorical <laughs> gesture, but we do know for what it's, um, I think I said this earlier, but I really want to like emphasize the point that anti-trafficking groups and organizations are funded by the police and they're funded by the DOJ who need to fulfill certain numbers to continue to get funding. And uh, marginalized groups are targets because uh, we're the lowest income groups and we're the easiest to target. We don't have lawyers, you know, like it's, we don't have like the funding to to get the kind of protections that like, again, like Robert Kraft has, like he hired lawyers, he you know, did, did his thing through thousands of dollars somewhere and he's, he's off the hook. Um, yeah. Two simple solutions. Fix the immigration system, number one. Number two, stop criminalizing sex workers. Problem solved. Joaquin, you wanted to respond to that, you said? Yeah, I kind of, can you hear me? It says my internet's unstable, so I don't know. Okay, well, okay. Um, no, thank you so much, Esther, for adding that. And I think that that's a really, really important thing for people to know. And what kind of um, hits me is like the fact that um, so many, you know, I'm Mexican, I'm Latino, so like, you know, I, I grew up in the hood as a kid and then I had kind of a mixed class background, but so I've mostly lived in hoods though, you know, my adult life. So I'm just saying, it's like, you know, I, I'm from like certain places in which like I was raised in a certain way, you know, that like you don't really leave your neighborhood because that's where your family was. And, you know, and it's just this way of being. And so um, you, you can be a marginalized person and, and only know a certain story. And so many marginalized people like my, who might like be marginalized by the police you know, might still buy into this story that like anti-trafficking is good, you know, because they're not able to make that connection. Like the community has now access, right? Like being, you know, having access to, to these conversations to like, it's privilege, you know what I'm saying? It's like, it's, it's a privilege to know and articulate and access this information because there are so many sex, marginalized sex workers who don't even get to identify as sex workers. That's all they've ever known. They don't even get to have the language and the tools to, you know, access those resources. It's just life, you know, that's just life, you know? And so um, I always like to name that because getting that education out there, trying to reach people with the information that it's like, you might not even realize that these movements 
are funded by the, the same people that are killing you by the police, you know what I'm saying? Um, but, um, you know, it's, it's, it, that's where they, that's where the lie is, you know, that's where the lie is, is that um, they make it seem like you're, you, you want to be a good person, you know, you want to, you know, but if you're not someone who has been given the chance to question the reality of the situation, um, that's really, that's really harmful, you know, um, I don't know if I'm making sense of what I'm saying, but, um, I feel like that's something I've, I've experienced a lot, um, is, is just having to kind of educate people where I'm from about, you know, definitely just understanding that these things are, are created by people that are trying to erase our communities, you know what I'm saying? Um, and then, and then made it seem to be like something that is helping. So I don't know. Yeah. I wanted to tie in as well, a bit more of like a specific financial incentive there. So, um, Mr. Tamika, you mentioned diversion programs. So for people who don't know, um, there are some cities that have instituted diversion programs for clients who are arrested attempting to solicit sex work or get sex work, and they um, get to go to a usually one day seminar in which they hear um, a lot of horophobic propaganda about how, you know, sex workers are riddled with disease and everybody is traumatized and really you're committing sexual violence, stuff like that. It's called John School, yes. Um, and there is also one in Portland. And what's very interesting is that you have to pay a thousand dollars out of pocket to go do it. And then this money goes back into the very city and county that have just arrested people. <laughs> so, and if you look at even the own self-assessment from Multnomah County and from the Portland, Portland Police Department, those are the ones that we're most familiar with, um, the majority of the men, the clients who were arrested here are working class or poor men of color. I don't know if anyone's been to Portland. It is not a overwhelmingly diverse place. Most people are white. Most clients are white, but most of the clients arrested for uh, prostitution solicitation are men of color. Um, so I wanted to uh, bring this back to both. Um, uh, yeah, all the rest of you of how you think that the Nordic model will affect, uh, you know, men of color, clients, things like that, if it were actually implemented. It's going to be way worse than it is now. I mean, when I look at the numbers and, and, and now, it's already like that. They're already targeting men of color in the community that are out here seeking sex workers. You know, and, and it's only going to exasperate it and make it 10 times worse. You know, and, and <laughs> I don't, I mean, in my city, we are working to defund the, the police. Are, we are working on how we can decarcerate the system. We are looking at how we can revamp the criminal code to stop them from having these many powers to be out here actually doing this kind of work. You know, it, 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 I don't see anything good coming from it. You know, police have too many instances of harming people of color. You know, it's going to, all I see is more death and destruction. That's what I see coming. Yeah, in Flushing, um, in the massage businesses that we do outreach in, the majority of clients, um, you know, in that sort of, uh, like, economic bracket to see out these kind of massage workers, they tend to be Latino construction workers. Um, and, you know, ironically, these are the construction workers who are building the big developments that are gentrifying the place. But, you know, in that moment, when I think about it, it's, massage workers have a lot more in common with the construction workers than they do, the people who are trying to rescue them. And like that line of solidarity like doesn't get talked about enough um, about how I, I think there's so much care that goes on in that moment, you know, when massage workers are doing their work for like the, the tired bodies or just, you know, in, in similar ways trying to survive in the system and 
trying to live in the system. And I, I know oftentimes when we talk about like clients in the sex working community, it, there's, it's either like they're terrible, abusive people. Um, most of the time it's actually the terrible, abusive people. We don't really hear good stories about clients often. Um, but they're, you know, it, it's complex. Like the, the relationship between clients and sex workers are, are complex. There's this funny saying, um, what is it? Uh, sex work is retail and marriage is wholesale. That like some, some of the, um, I think I heard it from like one of the massage workers, but uh, yeah, uh, if, yeah, if the Nordic model happens, these trafficking can happen. Um, again, like the most marginalized demographics are going to continue to be targeted. It's not going to be the Epstein's of the world. <laughs> I um I actually have no answer for this question. I really can't answer this question because I'm a realist. <laughs> I'm very real and um I've just always lived by the clients don't care about us, so I don't care about them. Um they only come to get their service. And this is my experience, not taking away from nobody else's experience, but um from what I've experienced, clients only come and get one thing, and then once they get their one thing it's really, excuse my language, but it's, well, no, I'm not even gonna cuss, it's F you. But, um, and then they go about their business. So I, I could, I really don't care about anything that they have going on. Yeah, fair. <laughs> Does anybody else want to speak on that? Um, so uh, that actually, I'm um, talking about that kind of um, solidarity transitions us into something else I was interested in. Um, since sex work is so, uh, criminalized and so stigmatized, frequently sex work organizing um, is seen almost in isolation as though it's the only thing that you're um, uh, trying to benefit and organizing around. But I'm really curious, uh, particularly since we've talked about all of the other distal factors that go into being marginalized as a sex worker, what kind of alliances and solidarity with other working marginalized people do you see and do you want to see more of in the sex working um, advocacy movement? Sorry to do this. I, I, I work across. I work across so many different movements with such a variety of people. We all kind of work in this this gigantic silo of supporting one another here in in DC, at least. You know, um, a lot of these issues intersect so much that I don't I don't see why we can't help each other if we look at it from that perspective of the more we ask for the greater chance of us actually succeeding on some things, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm big on how they do things in, in federal government. They load a lot of stuff into a bill yeah. and that's how I operate. I feel like the more I load into a bill, the greater chance I can get some of the things that I actually want out of that bill, you know, and I encourage my cohorts to do the same thing because I work in, in so many areas that affect the lives of sex workers and drug users, that it is like a no brainer to be in, in housing advocacy. You know, it's, it's like a no brainer for me to be talking about the homeless and the homeless encampments. You know, it's like I have to speak up when we're talking about a, a drug user overdose. You know, I have to be in the room when we're having the conversations about Black people's protection against the police. I have to be in the room where we're talking about oversight of surveillance. You know, these are things that intersect on the people that I represent for. And, and in my own existence, I've had these issues. You know, and if, if I felt it and other people feel it, I have an issue with being able to cross the line and say, hey, how can I help you over here? Can you support what I'm doing over here? And maybe can we all get together and figure out how we can help this, 
You know, I love to work cross movements because at some point we got to succeed on some of this. Um, thanks for that, Tamika. I totally agree with you. I, I feel you on that. Um, something that I, I'm thinking about, it's like, I, I, I'm never, I'm always trying to like uplift and like not criticize just, just to keep, because there's so much internal, you know, conflict within the sex worker movement, but it, it really does irk me. And I, I do always kind of push for this. It's like, you know, it's, it's like interesting because like sex workers can um, fall into any class of people, any race of person, like you could be like a, you know, thousand dollar and like, I don't know, I've, I've made as, as little as $20 or as much as like a thousand dollars, you know what I'm saying? So it's like, you can, depending on whether you're trans or cis, all these things, you know, or whether you just have a business or, but, you know, obviously access and privilege is a huge part of that. And um, again, I'm going to come back to something that I really appreciate uh, about the questions you posed for me to join be willing to join this panel, um, which is this idea that when we think about sex workers, it's literally white cis women. And I feel like that's extremely alienating because it's like not, and it's, it's complicated for me, especially now as a trans man to talk about it, right? Because I'm carrying like male privilege. And so I, I often don't, don't say too much about it other than to redirect and kind of like bring awareness because I don't want to misstep. But, um, but I will say that, um, you know, we can't continue to invisibilize people and that the narrative of, you know, the structures, the power structures of white supremacy is that, you know, the place in which a white cis woman is, is able to reclaim her absence of objectification is at the expense of a person of color. And that is, that is a great part of history as to why we are, where we are today with the carceral system and how it was built, you know? And so we can't forget that. And so when I see a movement that is really centered around cis white women who are often excellent advocates and friends and colleagues, um, but, but when we don't have that at the core of the conversation, that is a huge problem. Um, that is a huge problem that leads to death. And that's the only way I can really talk about it because I've experienced it, you know what I'm saying? And, and, I, and I see it every day in the work that I do. And so I, my hope to answer this question is to really redirect those resources because like I said, um, <clears throat> one of the things I see is like sex workers are super powerful, super brilliant, super you know innovative and productive and can make anything happen. And you know, it's like just really brilliant people, you know, um, but it's like, you can't lose the plot and forgetting that we're conditioned to believe that, you know, white supremacy is, 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 is wiring. It's at the core of the function of everything. And, um, and we can't continue to have a movement with that being the core. And that is what I, I want to challenge sex workers to uproot and how they come together and, and to understand that just because you are a sex worker doesn't mean that you are helping marginalized people. Um, and a lot of times I see these things like um, amazing like fundraisers or fundraisers with COVID safety funds. And it's like, who is that money going to? Like, is it going to street-based sex workers? Is it going to people who, you know, their, you know, website came down and, and I feel like, I'm sorry, I'm very impassioned about this because I deal with it every day, you know? And it's like, I, I want to push the sex worker movement to decenter white cis women and to center black and Latina, predominantly trans women. Um, and believe it or not, like we have a, a ton of, of trans men who are sex workers of color too. Um, you just don't see them that often because it's like, again, like I said, it, it's just hard to be a part of the conversation depending on where you're coming from. You know, you know, certain cultures, like we don't even have, like certain cultures, you, you didn't even know you were trans, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like they would have told you you could call yourself that. And so um, there's just, it's, it's this piece of erasure and visibility and, and wanting people to really understand where they stand in the hierarchies of, of privilege within the sex worker movement um, and making a change about it. So, so that, that's, my, that's my desire for um, solidarity, yeah. It's amazing. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, I guess even then going beyond solidarity, we've talked quite a lot about these things that aren't helping. So what do you want to see then? What do you want to see at the local level, national level? You know, what is it that is going to actually provide services that sex workers need? 
I want to see funding to the organizations that can protect sex workers. I want to see. I want to see. Uh, it. I want to see common stuff that should already be in place: housing, healthcare. Um, if you want me to stop sex working, more job opportunities with proper wages. <laughs> like, and, 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 and that's what I want to see. If, if we're gonna, if, if if people are going to quote unquote shame sex working, then once again, like I said, this whole entire panel put me in a better predicament. Make me know that I can give up sex work, and I could be okay. Make me know that I will have financial stability without sex work. And if you can't do that, then stop quote unquote bashing, slut shaming, horse shaming sex work because you cannot provide me anything that can make my life sustainable and stable. You can't do that. So that's what I want to see. And I think it starts locally. So that's why I'm knocking at local um, legislation, local politics, door high. My name is Casey Borges, and this is who I stand for. This is my community, and it's time for a change. If you won't make the change, the next person that's office, I'll knock on their door, and I'll just keep climbing the ladder and climbing the ladder and climbing the ladder until I get the answer that I want. So like I have a laundry list of stuff that I would like to see. We can cap. <laughs> we can cap it. Wait, tell us we'll make a list. It. Oh my God, that's a list. We can start it with defunding the police. You know, I am an abolitionist at heart. You know, I would love to see them go away and all that wonderful money that they're spending on policing to be put into resources. I would love to see the education system be restored to what it was when I was in school. You know, I feel like <laughs> I got one of the best educations before the 80s came because it started really eroding then. I would love to see sex work decriminalized. I would love to see the, I would love to see drugs decriminalized. You know, I mean, stop punishing adults for adult behavior. Let's put some sensible things in place to, to make sure that people are um, at least adults before they start playing in these fields. You know, I mean, let's make it safe as possible for people to do what they want to do. You know, instead of trying to figure out how to criminalize them because we don't do it. You know, everybody doesn't do everything. I mean, there are things that some people think are normal that I don't do. Just like they feel there are things that I do that they don't think are normal. I mean, but I'm not one to be invading and treading on people. And I would like people to stop invading and treading on me. You know, I would love to see a, 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 a world, a, a country where we had multiple parties instead of this bullshit ass two party system that can, keeps us in this 226 where we're stuck. We have been dug into a political hole in this country. Because when you look at it, Democrats and Republicans have played this game back and forth for decades and have put us in a predicament where our rights are being eroded. I would like to see this country going back in the direction that it should be. There should be reparations to, de de to descendants of slaves. You know, it is only fair. How are we paying reparations to Holocaust victims? We had nothing to do with that, but we cannot pay Black people for being kidnapped and trafficked and enslaved. You know, we need to be righting some of the wrongs. We need to be making it right with indigenous populations that were here before we were dragged here. You know, there are a lot of things that needs to be made right within this country. And we can start by putting money back into the people, invest in the folks that live here. You know, they talk, talk that crap about uh, make America great again. When were we great? Seriously, this has been a country that was kidnapped and pillaged. Genocide to the people. Come on. Let's get right with, with what should be. And stay out of people's business and learn to be a lot more tolerant and have some sensible legislation. That's what I would love to see.
Thank you so much. I want to hear from everybody on this. So whoever wants to step in next, what do you want to see? Um, um, I guess I can go. I mean, yeah, I mean, Tamika, like, is totally right. Um, I, I just feel like sex work is at the intersection of every possible issue, right? Like every single issue that such a sex work needs to, needs to um, like change and progress in, in a positive direction. Um, uh, I guess like the one that I would like to see because we work with migrant communities is more international solidarity. The trafficking organizations are international. They have a lot of money and they have a lot of power um, abroad. And the US is international police when it comes to um, migration patterns via tra like international trafficking law. Um, and I think our networks also need to be international. Um, we, we've been in conversations with like Scarlet Cha Cha in South Korea and Hong Kong when Hong Kong is not. Um, taken by China yet and some Taiwanese organizations, but it's really hard to create those lines, even if they're migrating, we're migrating back and forth, you know? And there's, there's not a lot of work done there yet, just because it's so early in the process of people coming together and being safe on in an in internet space, right? To, to strategize about how we can support each other internationally. Um, yeah, again, like gentrification in the US often happens from international Chinese companies. Like how do we tackle a, an enemy that is not even here, right? The enemy is abroad. How do we organize people who are abroad in order to fight for our rights here? I, you know, I would love to see more of that. Thank you so much. Um, okay. yeah. Bianca, I want to know what your answer is. <laughs> Me? Why? <laughs> I want to know what your answer is. Oh, I thought I already gave mine. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean, I don't know. My, my whole, like my, my relationship to the work is very um, ancestral and spiritual. Um, I'm not going to get into my whole story, but it, it all has everything to do with colonization and the way that this land was settled. And a lot of what Tamika said really rang true. It was just like, you know, this is one industry of, of capitalism that happens to kind of affect people the most impacted. You know what I'm saying? It applies to the people the most impacted in certain ways. And at the end of the day, though, it's, it's just another cog in the machine, um, which is, you know, the building of a nation on the backs of enslaved people and genocide um you know so for me like that's really just getting to the root of the issue as to why um people are robbed of the quality of life that they deserve um and and there's something very spiritually strong there um but um i mean everything everyone else said as well um so i'm grateful to be in community with all of you uh, but i, I did want to hear yours but i don't know if that's cheating so <laughs> you want to hear what I want to say? Um, I mean, uh, one thing that's really fantastic about New Zealand is uh, about living and working in New Zealand um, is you can see how there's no such thing as a one fixed solution. So sex work is decriminalized and we benefit enormously from that. However, New Zealand restricts that to um, sex workers who are permanent residents or citizens. So migratory sex workers are still criminalized. And when I was a migratory sex worker working illegally, that's you know when I was assaulted by a client and it adds a whole other layer of complication to something when you're supposed to be um, under this uh, legal system but they managed to get around it to exclude, you know, the most marginalized. Um, I also think, uh, you know, Casey, you've talked a lot about um, how HIV and sex work criminalization works in here. And I mean, uh, public health <laughs> in New Zealand, you can access PrEP and ART free and you can get clinic appointments for free. 
Um, so you don't need to worry about skipping doses because you can't afford it and things like that. And that's one of the reasons why the HIV rate is so low here. Um, and at the same time, New Zealand has a huge problem with unhoused folks. Um, it has a huge problem with wealth inequality. So I think sometimes Americans see other places that are doing um, better, I guess, um, and think of it as like a shining light on the hill, but it's really important to remember that doing better than the United States is not actually a standard to be proud of, like better than the worst is not actually um, such an achievement. And New Zealand still has enormous wealth inequality, um, particularly within um, our indigenous population and that manifests in sex work as well. So the fight continues. Um, it's just, we're a bit further along on the path here and decriminalization is not the end of the road. It's just one step as we pursue justice. One step in taking down white supremacy systems. So we ended up uh, integrating Q&A in the chat um, pretty much throughout, which is why I didn't leave too much time um, for the end, but we have four minutes. Is there anybody who has like a really burning question that they need um, answered? You can put it in the chat really quickly. And um, while we're doing that, um, does anybody want to uh, drop their links or anything about where your work can be found further? Because I think everybody is very excited about all the panelists and wants to read more of your uh, incredible stories. Hi, hi everyone. Everyone can um, um, find me on Baltimore Safe Haven's um, Facebook page. That is Baltimore Safe Haven. That is B A L. T-I-M-O-R-E, Safe Haven. Um, you will see me in their HIV stigma commercial. You will also see me in a lot of their panels. Um, I also have a new round table talk that is called The Good, The Bad, The Ugly, and The Happily Ever After. Um, we had our first episode yesterday that y'all can um, go see and it's talking about COVID while being HIV positive. You can also find my work with um, Free State Justice as the community organizer and um, my recent rally with my good friend Legacy Forte, um, Stop Killing Us rally for trans and queer individuals that have experienced state sanctioned violence in Maryland. And I think everybody else has put um, links in the chat. So thank you so much. Now our trans home, St. James Infirmary, Hips, Red Canary Song, uh, Baltimore Safe Haven, Free State Justice. And yes, um, so we are the Oregon Sex Workers Committee. Thank you all so much for being here. This was incredible. I really appreciate your time and your wisdom. And um, yeah, oh, I'll, so sorry. Um, thank you as well, Woodall Freedom Foundation, um, who has so kindly adopted us um, and forgives me even when I um, forget to thank them because <laughs> they're very kind. Uh, so thank you all very much so much for your time and everybody in the chat as well as our panelists. Have an amazing Hi, night. Bianca. Oh, yes. Um, I'm about to call you on Slack. <laughs> I just wanted to let you know that. Okay. Okay. No okay. All right. All right. <laughs> Bye. Thank you so much. Good night, everybody.